When it was evening on that resurrection day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when, they, when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Some 30 years after this resurrection day, Paul wrote to Christians in the Greek city of Philippi, he addressed how their identity in the risen Christ forms and directs life. He called this experiencing the power of Christ's resurrection. That is, when persons surrender themselves to death so that God raises them to new life. Dying to self and being raised to the resurrection life in Christ is what happened in your baptism. Or as others believe, what happens when a person accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior. However, entering this salvation life does not put an end to the experience of dying and being raised to new life. This is what we call conversion. It's a lifelong process. You, me, everyone who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior are works in progress. The apostle worded it so well when he wrote, I do not claim that I've already succeeded or am already made perfect. I keep striving to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has already won me for himself. That is why I forget what is behind me and do my best to reach what is ahead. I don't linger in the mistakes of the past. I learn from them, but I recognize in Christ I'm forgiven. Instead, my attention, my focus is the life that Jesus continually wants to form in me. As Paul goes on to say, God's good work continues in our individual lives and our life together as a mission community until that day arrives when every knee bows and every tongue confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. 
Until then, God continues this work every day. It's like my button with all those letters says, P, B, P, G, I, W, M, Y. Please be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. God had a plan in mind with creation. And God hasn't given up on that plan. Character gets molded. Community gets formed. Compassion gets fostered. And peace gets instilled. It's this last aspect of God's creation plan we're going to focus on over the coming weeks of the Easter season. John, when writing the Gospel at the close of the first century, continues to emphasize the manner Jesus greeted the disciples. And what was it that he said? Peace. Peace be with you. Now, as we heard, one of the eleven was not there when Jesus made the appearance. And upon joining them, the dazed and thrilled group eagerly told Thomas what happened. Their testimony left him unpersuaded. Thomas doubted, yes. But to label him the doubting disciple is not fair. Because what we find in reading through the Gospels is each of those disciples had their turn in doubting. Even on the mountain, on on Ascension Day, it said, and some still questioned. And I know you and I, we have our own times of doubt. For those disciples, (laughs) this was definitely a new experience for all. And even though Jesus had spoken about his being raised from the dead, none understood what this meant. Most likely, after Thomas made this declaration, that next week felt very awkward. A mixture of feelings swirled about. Puzzlement, uncertainty, hope, grief, and probably a good bit of annoyance towards Thomas because since he doubted, it caused the others to question their own experience. Then what happened? Jesus showed up again. And this time, he bestowed a blessing upon Thomas. Didn't scold him. Bestowed a blessing. Said to Thomas, peace be with you. The stunned disciple dropped his jaws, went to his knees. Gone was the insistence to place his hand upon the crucifixion wounds. Instead, with humble voice, he professed, My Savior and my God. Peace be with you. What does this mean? When John wrote his Gospel account, Saying, peace be with you, was a typical way folks greeted each other every day. Sort of like what we say, hey, how are you? And the meaning of peace be with you could bend one of three ways. One of those ways had been around for a hundred years or so. It was a celebration of the empire. We live without war because our army beat up all the other armies all around the Mediterranean. Peace be with you was a way of celebrating the emperor and our nation's military. That was not what Jesus was saying. Secondly, it could be a way of saying, hey, how you doing? It was the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew shalom. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the Jewish people greeting each other would say shalom. 
a way of expressing the hope for well-being in your life. It was a greeting used when you saw each other and when you left each other. Shalom. And in a culture where there was a melding of Hebrew and Roman and Greek and North Africa societies, those expressions got intertwined, got borrowed. But Jesus was saying a whole lot more than, I hope you're having a good day. Which brings us to the third understanding. The hope your life partakes in the Creator's desire for every person. The reason the Creator had the Son go to the cross and was raised from the dead. Jesus, now resurrected, bestows peace because that is what the triune God wants for every person. It's the plan that God had in mind from the beginning. Late in his life, John the Apostle got arrested by Roman authorities. They exiled him to a little rock of an island called Patmos. And from there, he continued to pastor Christian communities through his letters. Free from anguish, fear, anger, bitterness towards the Romans, the elder John spoke of the kind of life God makes possible through Jesus. Clearly, simply, John speaks about living like Jesus in the love and peace of God. Hear this excerpt from the letter. If we declare that Jesus is the Son of God, we live in union with God, and God lives in union with us. And we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. Love is made perfect in us in order that we may have courage on the day of trial. Our strength is in God's love. John makes this point over and over again through his gospel as he recounts what Jesus taught. The opening chapter mirrors the creation story and tells how God's word of peace creates and then gets embodied in the person of Jesus. It is Jesus who bestows the Creator's desire for grace and truth to permeate the world and all who dwell herein. Moreover, Jesus is the light entering the darkness of our lives. Darkness caused by sin, darkness caused by worry and anxiety. Darkness is always averse to God's intent for peace in love to reign. But I have to admit, although I confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, there are times I live absent from peace. And can you identify those events where you felt life pressing so hard upon you and so relentlessly that squeezed out was kindness or gentleness or patience. Instead, what got left was irritation, maybe even anger. For me, the memory is too recent. Even this week, I allowed this, that, and the other thing to pile up. I didn't pause to recalibrate schedule and emotions according to Christ's offer of peace. Instead, I rushed here and there and gave way to frustrations rather than giving proper attention to people and task. And where do those feelings come from? Those feelings of stress? Well, from inside. Nowhere else. I drove myself according to my desire to do things my way rather than to yield to the, yielding, the leading of the risen Christ 
and the working of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, who said, peace be with you, also said, as the Father sent me, I'm the one that's going to send you. Do it my way. The message Jesus gave was not just a message to help the disciples in those immediate days following the resurrection. Rather, it is the legacy for all who are believers, who are followers of the Jesus way. Peace is what Jesus would instill in each of our lives. Over the coming weeks of the Easter season, we're going to look at the implication and application of Jesus' word for our lives. Today, I began with the Apostle Paul's conviction to live each day to strive for that life in peace. He also went on to say, may you always be joyful in your union with the Lord. Always. Let me say that again. Rejoice. Rejoice. Show a gentle attitude toward everyone. The Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about things, but in all your prayers, ask God for what you need. Always asking with a thankful heart. And God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds safe in union with Christ Jesus. Those words covered my friend, pastor, and mentor, Lee Miller, the night of his first heart attack. Although he was only in his mid-50s, heart disease was an inherent ailment. In the middle of the night, as the sedation wore off, Lee became aware of a nurse attending to his care. He asked her a question and as he recalled, it was mostly out of curiosity. He said to her, am I going to live to see the morning? Then he realized how much he wanted to speak with wife Joan one more time. The answer Lee expected was either the professional voice encouraging him not to worry, or the pretend cheeriness that says, oh, everything is okay. Instead, the caregiver told him truth in a way that instilled peace. Mr. Miller, I cannot say whether or not you will see the morning. What I can promise you is that we are continuing to give you the best care possible to help your body overcome the effects of the heart attack. And as you and I are together in life this moment, I promise that throughout this night, I will be here by your side. With her assurance, my friend heard the resurrection, resurrected Jesus address him. Peace be with you. What worries he had dissipated as he felt each breath inhaling God's peace which is far beyond human understanding. Amen.